Good evening, everyone. My Lord Lieutenant, the Right Worshipful, the Mayor of the City of Derby, Councillor Robin Wood, and all our honoured guests joining us here either in this place, Little Over Methodist Church, or online, either live or at a later date. You're very welcome. We feel very privileged and delighted to have you here. My name is Chris Briggs. I'm the minister here at Little Over Methodist Church and also uh, the mission enabler for the Nottingham and Derby district of the Methodist Church. This is the launch event for Christianity Month, which runs throughout May. At that point, I must stop to tell you about toilets and fire exits. <laughs> So some of you have been here for a little while already, and no doubt you've found your way to most of those things, but if you need the toilets, if you go back out of the doors, the ladies is to the left, the gents just past the reception desk to the right, and there's uh, an accessible toilet there as well. Uh, fire exits out the back again, you can turn left or turn right, uh, or you can go down this side of the church. We're not planning any fire alarms, uh, so we hope that won't be necessary. Now, as I've mentioned, this evening will go online and onto our social media channels. And so if you don't wish to be seen on film, we've designated some areas um, which you can go into. Now, broadly speaking, they will be either side because the camera angle is straight down the front. Uh, you should also be aware that if you choose to ask a question of the panel later, it's likely you will be both on camera and your voice recorded. So if you would prefer to be uh, neither seen or heard, you may wish to refrain from asking a question. <laughs> or you may want to ask a friend to ask the question for you. I'm pleased that at various points we will see on this platform Michael Harvey, our keynote speaker, who will speak on the theme, What on Earth Has Christianity Done for This Country? Michael is uh, Chief Executive of the National Weekend of Invitation and was responsible for working with churches before that with Back to Church Sunday. Michael will also take part in our expert panel. He'll be joined by L. Warriner Davis, Chief Executive of Derby City mission responsible for so much good partnership work in the city. And Graham Penny, known well as a local businessman and I would say elder statesman of the church from Little Over, is here as well. Let me explain how the evening will unfold. In a moment, I'll invite Michael to deliver his keynote address. After that, we'll have a 10 minute or so break as a comfort break, and in case you'd like another drink, and that will also provide an opportunity for you to think about whether you have a question that you would like to ask of the panel. Now, I can't guarantee that everyone will get a chance to ask questions, but what we're not doing is a kind of um, question time type technique where I um, have the questions and I choose them. So we're going to live a bit dangerously, um, but if lots of people want to ask questions, clearly we won't have a chance for everyone uh, to do so. Uh, our panel will last probably between 30 and 45 minutes at most, or 30 seconds if there are no questions. <laughs> Please bear in mind, questions should relate to what Michael has shared with us or the general theme of the evening. Now, what about Christianity Month? It may be that you furrowed your brow a little and thought, I haven't heard of that one. There are special months, special weeks, and special days when we remember and observe all sorts of uh, special things that's going on in society and all sorts of good causes. But you might think, but I still haven't heard of Christianity Month. Well, in the interests of full disclosure, we think this may be a new venture, and we've just made it up. <laughs> but made it up because we think it needs to be made up and needs to be offered. In the midst of all the good causes around us and the remembrance of important issues, including social justice, awareness of illnesses, uh, contributions of individuals and groups, it seems to us that the Christian faith has done some pretty positive things for society. We've also got it wrong sometimes, but we've done some pretty positive things. 
it can be easy to forget the impact that churches, Christian organizations, and individuals have had on our society. Christians in the past and still today work to highlight the need for social justice, opportunities for those who don't have opportunities. They work to protect the natural world and to emphasize the spiritual dimension of life. Christianity Month aims to celebrate these good things and many more beside. As part of Christianity Month, we are putting on a number of different events, and you will have on the tables before you information about those events. We would encourage you to look at that and to come along to as many things as you would like to. There's a notice board outside in the entrance lobby which gives you even more information, and you can access information via our website on Little Over Methodist Church. I'm pleased also to say that we've been uh, offering local schools the opportunity to, for us to come in and take a lesson on what has Christianity done for this country, and I'm delighted that a number of them are taking up that opportunity as well. So please do feel free to engage with Christianity Month as much as you would like and to ask for additional information if you need it. My hope is that Christianity Month will spread and that what starts here in Little Over in the wonderful city of Derby will be replicated in other places with other Christian communities and groups. So thank you for being one of those attending on this inaugural occasion. And now it's time to turn to Michael Harvey, our keynote speaker. I've already mentioned Michael's work with the National Weekend of Invitation and Back to Church Sunday. He joins us as a visiting fellow from St. John's College, Durham University. Michael is a seasoned speaker and has spoken in thousands of churches. He developed the Acorn Spiritual Practice in May 2020. He's author of the books, Unlocking the Growth, Creating a Culture of Invitation, and his latest book is Invitation to Heal. His ministry has ranged over 18 countries and five continents. He's also a founder and director of God and the Big Bang, a schools-based organization, part of St. John's College, Durham, that demonstrates the compatibility of science and faith to over 5,000 school students every year. It's my pleasure and privilege to know Michael and to have worked with him and to invite him to give our keynote address this evening. What on earth has Christianity done for this country? Will you please welcome Michael Harvey? Well, it is great uh, to be with you uh, this evening. Um, uh, when uh, Chris uh, suggested this title, What on Earth Has Christianity Done for This Country? My mind immediately, immediately went to that scene in Monty Python. It just has to, hasn't it? It's just got to go, you know, with the question, what have the Romans ever done for us? And if you remember that scene, someone in the crowd shouts out the aqueduct. What? Um, they gave us the aqueduct. Well, yes, that's true. Uh, they definitely give that. And then somebody else shouts out, and sanitation. Well, yes, you know, that's true. By the end of the actual kind of dialogue, um, he has to summarize the conversation. Well, apart from medicine, Irrigation, health, roads, cheese, education, baths, and Circus Maximus, what have the Romans ever done for us? So the title, What Has Christianity Done for This Country, is a bit like that scene, you know, from Monty Python. It needs pointing out, however, that Christianity is wisdom for living. Wisdom for living that has stood the test of time. Yet I know it has been used to abuse people at times, no doubt about that. But for over 4,000 plus years, the Bible has provided some of the most 
inspirational, life-changing ideas. Who has not attended or perhaps led a funeral where the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is either sung or said, bringing comfort. Who of us does not understand the concept to go the extra mile? And how it makes or could make, could make a difference to society. Who has not gone to a wedding to hear Paul's definition of love? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. Who of us has not heard of the parable of the prodigal son? Who of us has not heard of David and Goliath? Who of us has not heard of the good Samaritan? If people want to understand why we are having the current debate about refugees, refer to that story. This is hardwired into our collective consciousness. Jesus is the greatest short story teller of all time. And it's absolutely ludicrous that we no longer know the stories and how those stories can impact this nation. For Christianity is wisdom for living. The influence of Christianity permeates society. And it's extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. In literature, we have Augustine and Chaucer and Shakespeare. But that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. In our musical tradition, from Gregorian chant to Johann Sebastian Bach, our artistic tradition of Michelangelo, Raphael and Rembrandt hanging in our galleries today. Our architectural tradition with the height of most cathedrals being 144 cubits because in the New Testament, heaven is called the city of God and the height is 144 cubits cubits. Our legal tradition is rooted in medieval canon law of the church. Our economic system, credit, is derived from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. Credit was a domain of faith in the medieval church. Even the Union Jack which hovers over Parliament, carries the three crosses of England, Scotland, and Wales. So weirdly, weirdly, the death of a Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago hangs over the civic life of this country. Christianity is the foundation of how Western civilization developed, but it is hidden in plain sight. Just recently, of course, we lost our queen. But in recent years, she took up the role of highlighting the role of Jesus Christ in her life. 
On Christmas Day 2002, for example, Queen Elizabeth II said, I know just how much I rely on my faith to guide me through the good times and the bad. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right, to take the long view, to give of my best in all that that day brings, and to put my trust in God. Christianity is the foundation of human rights. There are no human rights if you are an atheist. For where did they come from? I would maintain they come from Genesis. The assumption that we should care for the weak and the poor, where did they come from? Schools. It was because Jesus was a teacher that the first schools set up were Christian. Jesus was a teacher and he taught everyone, everyone, regardless of their age, their gender, or their status. Certain people would not, in those days, be allowed in the synagogue. So what does Jesus do? He teaches in the open, so that everyone can hear him. It's important to realize that Sunday schools were literally, originally, schools. They were places where poor children could learn to read. It was the English Anglican evangelical Robert Rakes who was around in the 18th century. He was the key promoter of the movement. And then denominations, non-denominational organizations caught the vision and energetically began to create Sunday schools. Within decades, the movement became extremely popular And by the mid-19th century, Sunday school attendance was a near universal aspect of childhood. The foundation, the foundation, folks, of free, free education for all. All coming because this teacher, 2,000 plus years ago, then that teaching went into the life of his followers many, many years later. Jesus taught that children were of value and teaching was vital and education, understanding and wisdom are all biblical principles. But I have to say, we must not leave it there. It's time for another reformation in our schools. We have just seen recently some of the issues pertaining from Ofsted. Moving forward, we need to rediscover Jesus as teacher. We need a complete radical shift of the focus of our schools. Instead of focusing on data knowledge, and information. We need to start to focus on the soul, on the why a child is here, what their gifts are, what their passions are, why they are here. Because God, from a Christian perspective, sent us here for a purpose. And that our entire lives... Whatever we're going to do is driven by that entire purpose. That we have something unique to contribute. That no one else can contribute. And educators, anybody that's got any education background, we are here to help young people discover who they are. Why is that important? Why would that be a reformation? 
Why is that vital for our nation right at this moment in time? Well, because if children from the youngest of age know that and can integrate that in terms of that they are special, that they come here for a purpose, it's part of their wiring and they can sense it, I believe that will create confidence and security to focus on what light they are bringing to this world. So in other words, this reformation of education, I believe, has to start again based on the biblical concept of I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Christianity always needs to be reforming. There is something always new in every generation. A relationship with a child does not begin when they are five, but before they were born. Adoption. Adoption. Baby girls in Greek and Roman times were abandoned at birth. But Christians started adopting them. There, there was something about Jesus' own life where Jesus was adopted by Joseph. From that, Christians somehow understood the principle of adoption. So Christians have been at the forefront of adoption. 1963 and in 1964, two baby boys were born. The first was kept, but never lived with his mother or knew his father. The second was given away for adoption to Dr. Bernardo's. Sadly, for the second boy, it took five years for the adoption to take place. The first boy found a spiritual father in a church just like this through the children and the youth work and found a father, a spiritual father, who believed in him before he believed in himself. It was a spiritual adoption. I am the first boy in that story. I survived and thrived because of a Christian. My brother died three years ago far too early. Moving forward, we need to highlight that there are 80,000 children in care. I just want us to let that just sink in for a moment. I mean, shocking, isn't it? 80,000 children in care. That was in 2020. In the same year, only 3,440 were adopted. It's heartbreaking. It, it, it's heartbreaking. But Christians were at the forefront of adoption. In the area of science, in the area of science, Christian scientists took a biblical principle that there were laws that could be understood. Men and women, pioneers of science, they've enhanced every person's life that's sitting in front of me right now. Francis Bacon, Robert Boyle, Isaac Newton, Mary Anning, Michael Faraday, Ernest Rutherford. Christians who took the idea that we have a God who placed in our universe laws that could be understood and started to find those laws. Well, moving forward, 
as we think of the new scientific discoveries? How can we influence how new technologies are introduced? For example, artificial intelligence. It is a major new discovery that is already here and people are really worried about its impact. What we tend to do is introduce new technology without any ethical consideration whatsoever. We, we don't think about the side effects. You know, like when you take medicine, you know, there's always the side effects. When we introduce new scientific technology, we should be thinking of the side effects. Robots to look after older people. Interesting, because we've not got enough carers. Is that good? Is that bad? We need to be thinking about these things. How can we also, from a scientific perspective, as Christians, tap into prophetic imagination? I mean, would you add and leave it? The scientific method can only come into operation if you have a thought, if you have a vision, if you can see something. And I would suggest that we need to really research in what I would call invisible realities, such as hope. I mean, that's a corker, isn't it? Hope. Wow. We all know when there's hope around. And by the way, we all hope, know when it's not around as well. There's, it's invisible hope, isn't it? It's really invisible. And yet Christianity brings hope. Love, the love of a mother. You know, I, I have some grandchildren now and, you know, from time to time they fall. And, you know, the, the tears come, rush straight to mum and it gets kissed better. Two minutes later, they're back running again. But this invisible reality of love, which, which the Bible talks about, yet we need to tap into invisible realities because they drove the likes of Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King. It is these biblical principles which inspire spiritual entrepreneurs to extend the kingdom of God. In healthcare, hospitals in their earliest form originated in monasteries because Jesus said we had to care for the sick. You can't talk about nursing without mentioning Florence Nightingale. A Christian, 17 years of age, she felt God's call into service. And during the Crimean War, she totally transformed the care of wounded soldiers. And then brought that back to the UK and provided care and equal treatment for the poor. Her example inspired the founder of the Red Cross. Classic example of Christianity being passed on. Disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. So the question for all of us is, who's discipling you and who are you discipling? Who are you inspiring? Moving forward, how can we move towards disease prevention? I think it's just completely unacceptable at this moment in time that I don't think we've really got a national health service. I think we've probably got a national illness service. But could we start to actually really do some thinking about prevention and some real investment in prevention? 
I've made the case in my third book um, that we need a field of research which might be called Numa Biopsychosocial Approach, which is to do with the spirit of the person. I believe if we actually look at the uniqueness of the person, we might find some prevention there. And I think, I think Jesus is one of the greatest social pro 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 prescribers. In prisons, Elizabeth Fry, who is called the angel of prisons, transformed the conditions for women. In business, Cadbury cared for his workers and provided homes. In poverty alleviation, in modern times, we've got food banks who give out 2.5 million parcels, mostly based in churches. CAP, Christians Against Poverty, helped 22,000 people get out of debt. These pioneers take Jesus' command seriously to help the poor. We have the Salvation Army, the YMCA, Tear Fund, Children's Society, the Samaritans, AA, all founded by Christians who are called. More locally, Derby City Mission, which was established in 1989 by Jeff Holland. Interestingly, once again, pioneers who are called. They are awkward people, pioneers. They're annoying because they're one-track people. They don't let go. Um, but he was moved. And that is often, you see, what I was talking about, that we need to kind of move to helping people discover who they are. Because it's that movement, that movement, that, that seeing that an individual can do, which makes all the difference. And Jeff was moved to action because he saw conditions that, that poverty brings. The poor housing conditions, homelessness, hunger, debt, and addictions. And his heart was to reach out to meet not just the physical needs, but the spiritual and material needs of local people. And right around this country, examples like Derby City Mission are there, doing a job hidden in plain sight. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. The challenge, he said, if you can show me people like Christ, I will come on board. That is a big challenge, isn't it? It's a big challenge. So let me be controversial here. You know, I have been in churches now for 40 plus year. I don't come, didn't come from a Christian family, anything like that. I think we have inherited a Christianity which has become attendance. Attendance Christianity. I mean, look how we're sat. There's the expert at the front and everybody else is not participating. Just your ears by this point, of course, are bleeding, you know, kind of through the intensity. We, we need to we need to kind of, anybody that comes across the threshold of a church building as a start, we need to discover who you are. Why you are here is not just for the children in our schools, it's for all of us. If we still have breath, if we still have breath, there is a role for you. And it's not a role that we're going to construct for you, it's what is there, waiting to emerge. What about you? You might be here this, this, this evening and thinking, well, that's all very good, that's what it's done for the, the country, but what has it done for you? See, something happened 2,023 years ago. Why do I know that? Well, because everybody here when they celebrate their birthday, the actual day is calculated from the birth of a baby called Jesus. 
2023. Isn't it interesting? I know, you know, kind of um, before common era has become the interesting kind of phraseology there. But something happened 2023 years ago. And every time we celebrate our birthday, it can be a remembrance of that. Jesus, this baby, who was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up still in another village where he worked as a carpenter until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. This Jesus never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never had a family or owned a house. He didn't go to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things one usually associates with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone. And today, this itinerant preacher is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Finally, what else can Christianity do for this country? About 10 years ago, something new came into my life. It was called the satellite navigation system. <laughs> of course, you key in your destination and a very polite lady tells you how to get to where you want to be. Before that point, I would travel miles and miles, you know, with your maps, so you get your map out, don't you? Only to get lost in the last five minutes of the journey and get totally frustrated. But what fascinated me about whoever invented the satellite navigation system was they never in their lives met me. Because what you do is you key in your destination and the polite lady, in my case, says you go straight for 300 yards and then you turn right. I immediately say, well, that isn't the quickest way. So I go 300 yards and turn left. <laughs> now, it's fascinating to see what happens to this polite lady when she does exactly what you ask her to do and you ignore her instructions. Firstly, you know what? She never loses her cool or get angry with anybody that disobeys the instructions. Secondly, she goes quiet. And then you hear her say, recalculating. And lo and behold, thirdly, she tells you how to get from the place thanks to me totally ignoring her instructions to the destination. From my sat-nav, I learned the greatest principle of hope, which is however lost you get, if you know where you want to be, there is always a route from here to there. You see, at some point, on my journey of faith, I discovered that more than we have faith in God, God has faith in us. He lifts us 
every time we fail. He forgives us every time we fall. He believes in us more than we believe in ourselves. He mends our broken hearts. Therefore, we should try to absorb faith. Inhale faith. Take within us as much faith as we can. And that Christian faith will give you and us the strength to handle all the insecurities that still lie around us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, so 10 minutes or so for a comfort break, to grab a drink if you'd like something. And I hope you'll have a think about a potential question that you might want to ask the panel arising out of what uh, Michael has said or the thoughts that relate to, the, uh, to uh, what Michael has said. Um, you may have something that's really uh, challenged you or you're curious about something or you may disagree with something. Um, but just uh, a few minutes to have a chat perhaps with the people around you and think whether there's something you'd like to follow up with. Thank you. See you in about 10 minutes. <laughs>